normal look abnormal and not make <coughs> abnormal look normal. So it's quite easy to do. That's what I'm saying. You have to know what you're doing with ultrasound because otherwise it looks like a testicle. <laughs> um, MRI is another one. We love MRI for um, our pediatric patients because it, again, not using any radiation. However, the problem with MRI, slow, slow. I, I keep hoping MRI will advance with its speed just like CT did. But it's still very slow, very expensive. Um, so here are some of the reasons we would do maybe an MRI on our pediatric patients. Um, you know, uh, this is a classic uh, question, maybe on an ARRT exam, or these kind of questions are, uh, in my experience, kind of classic. What organ does a Wilms tumor associate with? And it's the kidney. It's the tumor of the kidney. Um, uh, what organ uh, is... Uh, I gotta think of my terms now. Uh, Hinkley's loop of Hinkley. <coughs> Henley. <Hinley>. Thank you. <laughs> Henley. <laughs> what organ is that? That's the kidney. That's right? the kidney also. Yeah. So just things like that. Uh, the Isles of Langerhorn. What organ is associated with the Isles of Pancreas? So just stuff like that. I don't know <coughs> if they have those kind of questions anymore, but those are pretty classic. So again, just look at these um, and be familiar. If you don't know what something is, be sure to, you know, look it up. I like to look it up. I'm not going to say what is a Wilms tumor. I might say what, which of the following would an MRI not be used on kind of thing. Um, here's the, it's pointing to this, but you see here's the left kidney, and there's the spleen. And you can't even see, I think maybe this is the right kidney anyway. It's a tumor. A lot of times these get to be pretty big. Um, as the parent is washing the child, they feel a lump in their um, back area because it's grown so big. Um, and then we've, uh, MRI, the F in front is functional MRI. Some of you did a report on this. I think this is a... You, this is just FYI only. I'm not um, necessarily testing you on that, but how does functional MRI work? Do you know how it works? Have you studied this in any, like I said, I know some of you did a report on it. This is just um, absolutely brilliant, I think. Um, so what happens is they found out that oxygenated blood appears different than deoxygenated blood. And so they can tell blood flow based on, on this. So the MRI signal of blood is slightly different. And using a sequence of imaging, it measures a slight difference in those magnetic properties of oxygenated versus deoxygenated blood. And they can um, do images based on that. <coughs> so anyway, I just, I think it's um, just brilliant. So there, see, before MRI, you could tell, just like with ultrasound, just like with CT, you can only see structure, you can't see function. So if we wanted to do a functional exam, a lot of times we had to do nuclear medicine. So I, with ultrasound, I can tell you, oh yeah, the kidney's there, it doesn't have any tumors on it, it doesn't have any cysts on it, it's measuring the right size, or I can tell you if it's enlarged, but I can't tell you if it's functioning or not. Well, you know if a kidney's functioning or not because urine is produced, so if they don't have any urine, production then but you don't know is it one kidney's working one kidney's not are they both not that sort of thing so we'd have to do a nuclear medicine scan to determine that so here with MRI this adds a functionality to the MRI scan that wasn't there before so that makes it is this normal abnormal I, I don't know um, the colors mean nothing we can associate um, with a computer as you can with your computers, you can put a color on blood flowing this way and put another color on blood flowing that way kind of thing. So it's not like, oh, red is bad. It's not, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I would imagine blood flowing in one direction here and flowing a different direction here would be my guess since there's not um, And as I said before, nuclear medicine. You know, again, with our <coughs> CT and our nuclear medicine, um, these are radioactive, uh, radioactive substances here, and so we want to 
only use that if necessary um, for our pediatric patients. So uh, we can do uh, renal function, function uh, pediatric patients, in case you don't know, tend to have urinary tract problems, urinary tract infections, and that sort of thing. And it can lead to um, problems with the kidneys. What happens, um, maybe um, uh, the infection travels up the ureter, so therefore the ureters become dilated, the, um, and the kidneys, um, the renal, renal pelvis. Uh, pelvis. pyramids can um, enlarge. And so um, it would cause um, destruction of the, the kidneys if not caught early. So, um, so renal function would, and ureters would be um, of a concern. So maybe a nuclear medicine scan. Again, uh, what other exam that you know, that you know of will determine uh, what maybe could be done on a pediatric patient for urinary tract infections and uh, reflux? Mm -hmm. The Borean cystourethogram is done for that. So, gosh, what do you want to do? A nuclear medicine scan, or do you want to put a catheter into a pediatric patient, fill their bladder up, have them, you know, go to the bathroom on the table when when they've been taught not to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and so, it's, it, you know, you have to determine. So um, here's just I just think it's so cute. Look at it. So there are the kidneys picking up the radioactive isotope, and then as you proceed through, you can see it being excreted into the bladder. So that tells you if the kidneys function or not. Looks like both kidneys are functioning and producing, um, uh, excreting that isotope into the urinary bladder. A little bit bigger picture. You can see this one's working well, this one not so much. Looks like it uptakes a little bit, but it's not 100% functioning. So that's something that can be seen. And then rewards. Have you rewarded any of your patients? Have you given them any reward? Stickers. <laughs> stickers. Okay, yeah, stickers. Give them um, a high five. <laughs> good job. Yeah. A pat on the head. Yeah. High five. Um, who's at St. Jude? They used to have coloring books. Do they still have coloring books and crayons? Maybe not, because God forbid they were to eat one, you know, a crayon, and then the hospital will be sued. Um, stickers are usually pretty. Um, basic and everybody has that so look to see if you have those those are always nice to, to give I don't know anymore <laughs> that used to thrill them back in my day I don't know about now it's like until let they me start fighting over them pardon me until they start fighting over yeah them. that's true there you go and usually you just give them more I mean there we have plenty of them um, I think this was I can't remember where I got this oh um, Scottish Rite. Now, this was a hospital that I went to. They gave out coloring books. Um, we would blow up. Okay, here's something you don't do anymore. The disposable gloves, blow them up Hemp. into a balloon. And so we would get a Marxalot, and I would sometimes let the kid do it. Draw, we'd draw ears and eyes on it, and make it look like a chicken kind of thing, you know, right? Kind of, yeah, a turkey kind of thing. And so um, another thing, they liked that, and we'd tie it in a knot and give it to them. And then um, if they had an IVP, which we did a lot of those back in the day, the syringe made for a good um, water gun, that's right. And so we wouldn't give them the needle, of course, <laughs> but we'd wash out the syringe and we'd give it to them, because it's like one of those big syringes, and we'd like, you know, fill it up with water and you can squirt one with that. That would make them laugh, you know. So <laughs> it's changed since then. So we had stickers too, but we always thought it was fun to give them stuff. I had an ultrasound student who offered, I mean, now you just have to be careful with everything, um, <coughs> with the way parents, you know, raise their kid, you know. <laughs> and one of my um, colleagues got in trouble because he said, if, you know, to the child, if you hold still or if you do this, Mommy, I'll take you to get McDonald's. I'd be like, oh, I'm holding still. I love McDonald's. But the mom was like, oh, no, we don't eat that. Okay, so now the child's crying because he's not going to get McDonald's. <laughs> so you have to be, be careful. So um, this happened um, with, my, with uh, an ultrasound student. 
she was scanning the pediatric patient and oh, he was such a good boy and um, the parents were there and I was in the room and she goes you know she told the child and I think the encouragement is always good for any of anybody especially pediatric but adults love it too doing a great job you were a great patient thank you kind of thing um, and she said oh you were so good there's some candy out at the receptionist desk feel free to stop by and pick up some and the parents will I mean my thought was <gasps> you know can, is, can the child have candy you know why are they in here I don't know uh, and the parents were so cool with it. They were like, oh, thank you so much. And that's typically probably the reaction you're going to get. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. You know, my initial reaction was, oh, dear. Um, so what you need to do is make sure that typically you ask the parent if that's okay. And not in front of the child. Is it okay that they have candy? And the child's right there. <laughs> the parent says no. And the child's like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, um, so ask the parent, you know, we do have candy at the reception's desk. Can I offer that? Um, and yes or no or whatever and then oh and then what's fun is to hear what the parents are going to buy for the child if they hold still so forget what you're bribing them with the parents usually the one going I'll take you to McDonald's afterwards I'll go get some ice cream we'll go I'll buy you a new iPad I don't know you know whatever to get them to cooperate <coughs> so um, this a student sent me a picture of this um, this is what they had for their pediatric patients who were going into surgery. And so they dressed up the bear like that. Can you imagine a pediatric patient, or really anybody, but a pediatric patient laying on the gurney and you see all these masks and, you know, everyone looks probably scary. And so they dress the bear up like the, te you know, surgical team. Um, so, and let the, the child hold it as they go into surgery. So, it, you know, I thought that was a a neat little thing to do to help alleviate maybe some of the um, concerns for pediatric patients. So here's what I'm talking about. So diagnostic indications for chest exams. Um, there's quite a few and there's a lot listed in your textbook <coughs> also. So, so my question would be, which of the following would not be an indication for a chest exam? And you would have croup and cystic fibrosis and meconium aspiration and ileus. Ileus. So it would be the ileus, which is an abdominal uh, problem, right? What is an ileus? <laughs> Very good. It is the last por portion of the small intestine. Um, it's, uh, it also can be the way it's spelled. It can also be oh, an yeah. obstruction, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. You were absolutely correct. Um, it can also be an obstruction So of the bowel. So, um, so that might be, so you have to know what each one of those are, no, but you have to know that those are chest related pathologies, okay, so just look through, some of these you know, some of them you may not know. Um, aspirations, have anyone, have you done anything, has a child come in with um, aspirating something, a, a peanut in the nose, a swallowed <laughs> coin, what coin. Did you, a coin? Your mom checked the poop for three weeks. <laughs> oh, and it hadn't come out? Well, she said it didn't. But, yeah, but it wasn't in the child. And that, uh, usually a coin would not be a concern because it's rounded and it's probably going to pass on through. Oh, that's right. I swallowed a coin and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap. How stupid. It's like, why would a child swallow a coin? I didn't like oh, here's a coin, I'm going to swallow it. I didn't do that. I was. I remember this because I was so scared. So scared I didn't tell anybody. We were playing with coins. How stupid. I know, it's stupid. I was very young, but I remember it. Throwing coins up in the air and catching them in our mouth. <laughs> How stupid. Okay, I you had a hole in one, huh? Tooth, you know, blind me. Um, but I caught it in my mouth and wanted to slip right on down my throat. <laughs> I was like, oh no. Bullseye. Okay, that wasn't that much fun anyway. <laughs> uh, so cystic fibrosis. Um, I used to teach, um, in, back in Texas, I used to teach um, radiographic pathology. And, you know, it, so it was a fun class. We'd just look at x-rays and guess that pathology and talk about pathologies and all these, you know, neat things that you could see. 
Um, but when it came to chess, I called in a radiologist. It was like, oh, TB, cancer, it all looks the same to me. So I would call in a radiologist as a guest speaker and go, have at it, because I can't, a few things I can tell, a few things, but overall, no. So cystic fibrosis, you can see the little cysts forming um, in there. So these are just some of the things. And this is so cute with the little teeny tiny um, chest x-rays, if you've seen those in um, NICU. Um, one thing about chest x-rays, um, we're going to talk more about the positioning, but at, what you notice about this chest x-ray is um, it says meconium aspiration syndrome. I, I don't know. I, oh, this is the aspiration. I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, but, but what do you notice about this chest x-ray compared to like maybe an adult chest x-ray? What stands out about this chest x-ray? The heart is gigantic. The heart. Look how, you know, look how big. A lot of times it's, all, it's just more midline than it is off to the left. So that's a little disconcerting. Do you see this area right up here? A lot of times, that's the thymus. A lot of times that'll show up. It goes away as we're adults. It shrinks and, and disappears as an adult, but as a child it will be there, so it looks like a mass um, in the uh, upper chest area. So those are some things that you have to know. Uh, here are the clavicles. A lot of times, you know, they, again, they look different from the way the arms are. If their arms are just laid by the side. The clavicle um, kind of comes in, so it's not as straight. Uh, but when we're doing a chest x-ray of a pediatric patient, we still use the same positioning criteria to make sure it's straight, not rotated, and that's but yeah, the heart and the um, thymus gland can kind of throw you off a little bit. Here are some other ones. Um, epiglottitis and highline membrane disease. They call this a ground glass appearance. Uh, pneumonia, pneumothorax, any thyroid gland disorder. Um, again, not the best picture. You, um, you can tell this patient is pretty sick, but um, it looks, has the appearance of ground glass being in the lungs. Uh, epiglottitis, you can kind of see that here. Look at the, you know, especially with a crime, they've got air um, in the oropharynx and down here, but can you see right there that soft tissue swelling, closing up the airway. Obviously, they're getting air through, but probably not much. What is that? <coughs> George Washington. Huh? George oh, Washington. Yeah. Oh, are you going to Very good. You can tell when you studied or not. Um, neonatal Graves disease. Again, uh, not something I, I can't tell you what. So anyway, move on. Uh, chest x-rays. OK, so how are we going to do a chest x-rays on a pediatric patient? How do you do it on an adult? You find T7 either do it in the AP position, right, three to four inches from the sternal notch, jugular notch, or you do your hands in the back, right, or the lower portion of the scapula. I don't know what all you were taught. Um, several ways to do that. However, on a pediatric patient, you're not going to be able to do that. So basically, we put the um, CR to the mid-thorax at the nipple line. So this right at the nipple line, uh, mid-sagittal plane. And um, that typically will do it, collimate to the chest margins. Uh, as a, an adult, you use 120, 110, 120 kV, right? Is that what you learned? Do you remember? What do you use now? Do you look? It's like 125. Okay, 125. But on a pediatric patient, two reasons yes, you why you use. Really? One reason you use anything above 100, right? You use a, above 100 at least? 110. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. The reason you're using, two reasons why you're using that high KV range. Do you know why? Because of the, the grid, right? Or the grid, yes, you have a grid in there, and so you have to, it, from non-grid to grid, you have to increase something, mass or KV, so we increase, that's why we go up to in the hundreds, as opposed to when I did them back in the day, um, we did a non-grid technique at, at 80 KV, 70 to 80. Okay. The other thing for the other reason for high KV is for uh, grades. Yes, your shades of gray. 
so that you can see the lung markings all the way out to the edges of the lung field. We want to make sure um, it's not a high contrast image, but a low contrast image. So that's another reason. So notice for a child is different. We're not using the grid. And um, while we do want to see lung markings, that high of a KV is just way too much for the small size of a pediatric patient. <coughs> so we're back down to the low KV. Notice there is no grid um, here. So again, you want to use your um, high MA short exposure time. High MA, not high MAS, high MA short exposure time. Um, if they're recumbent, your tube will not go up into the ceiling for 72 inches. So you just get the maximum distance that you can when they're recumbent like this. Um, if you are doing a erector up at the wall unit or in, a, in the pigostat, then you can use your 72 inches as normal. Okay, and then no grid. So just know, you know, I'm gonna ask you, the, you know, when doing a pediatric chest x-ray, where do you center? Kind of thing, so. Uh, nipple line, uh, mammillary line, what KB range would you, so what, <coughs> typically, focus on what's different. You already know what to do for an adult chest x-ray, so what's different for a pediatric chest x-ray? That would be the easiest way to figure it out. Um, the pigostat um, is used um, typically up to age two. I think we um, said that's the number we're gonna stick with, uh, depending on the size of the patient. Um, and a pigostat, everybody, just so you know, that seat that they sit in, that little bicycle seat where their legs hang down below the level of the table, um, the seat can be raised up, so if we wanted to do an abdomen, we could. So this is <coughs> great for chest and abdomen. They can actually be raised up, and you can do more of an abdomen um, if you wanted to do that. So um, that's not a real patient. <laughs> I hope not. So anyway, um, the arms are up nice and out of the way and it holds them really straight. Uh, here's a device, I don't recommend these. These are little things you can turn and so like if you wanted to put upright and then a marker kind of thing, you can put those in there, but why do I not like those? Especially the markers. <laughs> so this would be, you know, what, a right maybe? And it would show up on the x-ray. Is right in the area of interest or? Well, it could be. Uh, you'd have to make sure your patient was out of that range and it was in the light field, but it doesn't have your initials on it. So I've never been a big fan of just an R, you know, the, the generic markers. Sometimes it's fine for like, um, you know, for the Reese, remember how uh, it was kind of frustrating to do a Reese and you want to collimate closely, but then you've got to open up your collimator for your big fat marker in there too. We used to have little tiny, and I don't know if they have them at your hospital, little tiny R's and L's. So those were nice to be able to put close to the image. You don't just do a Reese by itself. You usually do it with other images. And plus now with digital, it comes up um, as to, you know, it's all electronic now as to who did it. So um, the criteria for the chest x-ray is the same as it, you know, is for an adult. No rotation. Well, how, you can't just say, oh, <coughs> And I think we've taught you this in life. You can't just say on your lab sheet, no rotation. I, I don't know what you're looking at to make that determination. You have to say no rotation due to, or you don't even have to say no rotation. You would just say SC joints are equal. That indicates no rotation. Um, so you, on pediatric patients, it's kind of hard because, again, um, with the moving and sometimes the position of their arms, it's hard to tell. Um, but you do want those SC joints equal. And then um, the lungs fully expanded, just like an adult, nine to 10 ribs, if, if possible. Um, just like that. Exposure factors, you wanna see just like an adult, the spine slightly seen behind the heart. Now to see this heart, see how it's more midline as opposed to off to the left a little bit. So that's common for pediatric patients. Again, notice this thick area up there, like really, when has the heart done that? Right, usually you'll see you know, something over here, and you'll see that aortic arch, right? But again, this is a thymus gland, so a lot of times that'll be seen, and that's not <clears throat> pathology. So, um, and then again, the emotion, so same criteria. Um, I think we talked about this already in NICU. Do you have to um, do right and left markers on your NICU patients? Mm -hmm. uh, nursery. Where are you at, Mr. Mm -hmm. 
Hope and hope. I was going to say hope. Um, I know that they have to put both right and left markers on there. Why? Why do you think that is? Do you know why? I think you mentioned in case the tips cut off, or maybe not. I don't know. Okay. Um, and when there are cases, um, it's not common, but it's not rare of situs and verses. And you need. How can you tell? How can you tell here, right? I mean, right, if a, typically if you have a chest x-ray without a marker on it, you know which side is the left side because the heart's on the left side. But if I have, well, not anymore because I probably got rid of them, but um, I have several cases um, of radiographic film with situs and verses on it of the chest. And so, um, so I, I think having the right and left markers make sure as you you know, the doctor can, there's no other way to tell right or left. I mean, you, you can a little bit. I'm sure a radiologist probably could, but I think that's the reason because of this heart being more midline. I think they had a a lawsuit somewhere um, that the, the images that went to court were mismarked. And so, do you have the policy still where if you don't have a marker on your image, you have to repeat it? At Hogue. Um, at one point they had, if you don't, listen to this, if you don't have a marker on that image, within the image, you have to redo it with the marker on there. So I don't know that they have that anymore, but um, that was a policy at one point. So some of your hospitals are very adamant about having a marker on the image and some of them not so much so. So where are you? That's where we Okay. We so have texts who don't even carry markers. Okay, so they don't care whether the marker's on there or not. They annotate everything. Mm -hmm. Good for them as long as they yeah. annotate it correctly, yeah. um, you know. And sometimes it takes a lawsuit for that. But it, it, you know, who di is going to dictate that is the, are the radiologists. So if they don't care, and let me tell you, to not support that, but maybe the reason, radiologists don't need a marker on an image, typically. Mm -hmm. I mean, they. And don't argue with them, because <laughs> here's what I did. I mean, I don't know if I told you this or not, but here's what I did. And, you know, the young dummy. Um, gosh, the things you remember, right? We're at the processor. Um, is an ER case. The doctor, not the radi you know, as a radiologist, he walked up. Ah, I always hated this. You know, they sit there and wait with you while the image is coming out of the processor. And you just hope and pray that you pray to the processor, please bring it out perfect. <laughs> you know, make sure it's not a repeat. You know, please don't be a repeat. The doctor's standing right there. Pull it up, and it's an abdomen. He goes, okay, and he, and he started to kind of walk off, and he goes, he mismarked that. And guess what came out of my mouth? It just flew out of my mouth. Like, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> he didn't say another word. He just walked off, and I sat there. Sat there. I it. I was like, oh, I hate myself. Why would I say that to a radiologist? How stupid. I learned that if they say, if, you know, you mismark it, okay. If they say your patient was upside down, okay. <laughs> you know, I just, I was like, oh. Um, but that's exactly what I did. No, it, no. So I'm just saying, if they don't care, if the radiologists don't care whether you mark a film or not, then you don't. That's fine. If they, if annotation is okay, then that's up to them. Um, just be aware if you go somewhere else at Hope Hospital, you're going to have to have a marker in every image. Is that hard? No. It's just something you just have to get used to. It's not that big of a deal. And with digital, with the annotation and stuff, it, that's fine. Because you, let me tell you, you can annotate wrong, correct? Mm -hmm. Can't you also put your marker on wrong onto your image? So. <coughs> Whatever your facility decides. Um, but I'm one of those, I can put a marker, in, I, I'm in surgery and I put a marker on my surgical images. So, you know, anyway. Um, so lateral chest, um, about the same KD, um, and we're still at the mammillary line, but now we're at mid-coronal plane instead of mid-sagittal plane. So um, making sure the child is not rotated is probably the hardest thing. Um, and um, certainly on this um, device, you can tell definitely that they're going to be, be straight. Take a stat, 
very easy to do. Criteria is the same. How do you know the uh, an adult uh, an adult is rotated or not? It's the gap between yeah, the posterior so ribs. The same criteria as you would for an adult. Uh, no rotation by the posterior ribs being superimposed. You still want to see the lungs fully inflated, that sort of thing. So really no difference there. And then you want to see from the, um, the apex to the um, Here are some abdomen exam indications. So again, looking at some of these, you know, do you know what that means? Do you know what this means? Um, do, do you know that these are diseases of the bowel? I don't know. So if that's something you don't know, you might want, I'm going to let you take the time to look it up of what you know and what you don't know. So these are some of the other things. Um, liver issues, um, horseshoe kidney, that's not really um, a pathology. Have you seen a horseshoe kidney uh, image? Oh, this is so cool. It's where the kidneys, okay, so you have, <laughs> always do this, here are the kidneys, right? You notice how the kidneys lay in the body, the spines down the middle, kidneys are like this. And so horseshoe kidney, the bottom, the, uh, let me see now. The um, lower pole is um, attached across the spine, so it's like that, like a horseshoe. Yeah, and so it's a typical. It's a it's a congenital anomaly. It's not so much as a pathology. Um, so they're still like fully functioning, right? Yeah, they can be. That wouldn't cause it not to be functioning, but yeah, as far as I know, they're they're still functioning. It's a, and I remember. I've seen two kidneys on one side and, and one on the other. I've seen both kidneys um, on one side, nothing on the other side. I've seen one kidney up in the normal position, another kidney down in the pelvis area. <laughs> Ultrasound, you're like, have you had any um, kidney surgery? No. <laughs> the patient's like, no, why? And then you find it down in the pelvis where it shouldn't be. You know, it's just, it's crazy sometimes. Um, I had a, a friend in growing up in grade school and high school 